Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, and, and we are delighted you're here. We're delighted uh, to have this opportunity to feature an old friend of the archives, uh, Glenn Browder. Um, a couple of business things. Let me remind you to turn off your cell phone uh, if, if you haven't done that already. I'll do mine. <laughs> and and um, uh, we, the, this is a, a special architrage. We, we do these occasionally when something's coming out like a new book or, or some special event. But our regular architrage program this year is really a special series, and we invite you all to come back next Thursday uh, the, at, at noon for a, a, a program in a continuing series we're doing for the year of Alabama history. Uh, the program next week is going to be on uh, the, the New South, re the rebuilding of Alabama uh, after the Civil War, and Marlene Reichard, who, a longtime professor at Samford University, will be making that presentation. What we're doing, uh, if for those of you who are interested or haven't seen this, we've got a list of the programs, and we're kind of doing a chronological overview of Alabama history. Uh, this year, and so the next program will be uh, Marlene Reichard, and we have a lot of other great programs coming up for the rest of the year. Um, but to get right to the program, I'll make a, a relatively brief introduction, but it's going to be hard to be too brief uh, because there's so many things I want to say about uh, Glenn Browder. He's been a friend for a long time. He was uh, one of the first members of the legislature I met when I came here. I, I came here in the summer of 82, and he was elected to the legislature that fall. Um, when he joined the legislature, there was a legislative committee set up to look at, a uh, joint legislative committee, to look at historical records issues in Alabama, and, and Glenn was appointed to that committee. And we spent some time, we, we went to some other uh, state archives, looked at problems and issues, that they're facing, came back and did an assessment of conditions, a report of condi conditions in Alabama, and it led to uh, some, some other, some major efforts that we did in setting the direction for the archives. And so uh, we've been friends ever since then. Uh, Glenn just served for one term in the legislature before he ran for S Secretary of State. Many of you kn know this already. Uh, was elected Secretary of State and then was elected Congressman from the 3rd District and served for three terms, I think. And Glenn, wasn't uh, uh, Bob Riley ran for Congress after you stepped down, right? Uh, so served in Congress, ran for the U uh, Democratic nomination for the U.S. Senate in 1996, uh, and when he was defeated in the Democratic primary, uh, resumed his career as an academic. Uh, he uh, re returned to teaching. He taught both at, at Jacksonville State and at the at, at, uh, Advanced Navy Graduate School in California, and he kind of spent his time for the last 10 years or so going back and forth between Alabama and California. But I think he's now retired. He's reflecting on a very active career, and he's uh, preparing a, a series of books uh, of, of his, on his, based on his experiences and what he learned, and uh, uh, we are looking forward, I'm looking forward to hearing that today. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Congressman uh, Glenn Browder. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. <clears throat> now, all I can say is, wow, look out across uh, this audience. And I see a lot of the faces who were around to educate me. About a quarter of a century ago, when Professor Browder came down here to begin his official education in Southern politics and American democracy. All I can say is, wow, too, when I think about uh, some of you out here I mentioned in the book. Let me warn you, this book is just a general commentary. <laughs> don't, don't feel uncomfortable about it. I get into the real, I guess, good and bad and ugly in the next book about politics in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But it is uh, nice to be back here <laughs> with you. What I'd like to do is talk for a few minutes and then uh, open the discussion up to questions and answers. And then we'll have time afterwards for uh, book signings, if any of you would like to purchase the book, which is, uh, I think will be for sale up here. And I believe the price is 
1495, some, somewhere around there. So it's, it's an affordable book. And I, I, I think you'll find that this is a, an unusual book. I wrote the South's new racial politics because I didn't think that anybody else, neither politicians nor professors nor reporters, can write this book. They can't provide the critical inside analysis of contemporary Southern politics. Now that may sound arrogant, probably because it is, but with my uh, background in uh, academics and public office, and Ed did mention uh, for about 10 years during that time, I worked as a campaign consultant in uh, Southern uh, elections. That background has given me, I, I think, a unique perspective that at the twilight of my career, I'd like to share because I don't think anybody else can offer that perspective. The problem, by the way, uh, please pardon my language, I'm going to have to cut through the academic, the stale academic language to get to the bottom line. The problem is that race is still the bastard reality of Southern politics and history. It's like the illicit offspring that keeps showing up at the family reunion. <laughs> family members are reluctant. They don't want to talk about it. They won't, don't want to talk about who he is, where he came from, what's he doing here, and is he ever going to quit bothering us? <laughs> of course, legions of observers have written about conventional aspects of the region's shameful racial experience. However, none of the key participants in today's public arena seem willing to acknowledge, seem interested in pursuing, or seem able to articulate other important aspects of those workings, the inner workings, in our still, in our evolving but still racetrack political system. Now there's enough in that little book, it's a, a relatively brief book, there's enough in that little book to antagonize all my friends, politicians and reporters, historians and political scientists, whites and blacks, southerners and non-southerners, liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, do-gooders and do-batters. But I think that my analysis is true and it has serious ramifications from Southern Crossroads all the way to the White House. So what do I want you to take away from uh, this meeting today, this session? Very simply, if you don't remember anything else, I'd like for you to know that there's a new system of racial politics. I call it biracial accommodation in the South. The Southern race game endures and real Southern politics is still not much to brag about. But the new politics is different and arguably better than anything we've ever tried before. So academics and journalists should scrutinize the system that I described with reopened minds want to be politicians would be wise to study the book before stepping into the political stage. Finally, openly discussing the new racial order, I think will be good for all of us, black and white, southerners and Americans, to move forward in regional and national democracy. Okay, what do I mean by a, a couple of these terms? The race game in real southern politics. 
The white leaders and people of this region historically have engaged in a race game designed to provide themselves the blessings of democracy while oppressing, exploiting, and discriminating against their fellow human beings of African origin and heritage. Historically. And real Southern, what I mean by real Southern politics, real Southern politics is the raw racial conflicts, trade-offs, alliances, transactions, both out front and behind the scenes that have underlain the Southern race game for the past half century. So we have a new racial system for the 21st century. I think that there is a new culture and practice of biracial accommodation in Southern politics, and it is qualitatively different from that of yester yesteryear. In substance, style, strategy, operations, and outcomes. We're not going to talk about all those things here. You can read about them. Mainly what I want to talk about is that essential element I was talking about, biracial accommodation. Biracial accommodation is the ironic and awkward cooperation among contemporary white and black Southern politicians to deal functionally with their region's peculiar legacy of hard history. You know, I hate this part of a book event where the author reads from the book. You know, you can read yourself, but some of you don't have a copy of the book. I want to take a break and read pages 74, uh, excerpts from pages 74 to 77. If you've got the, the book, you can, you can take a look. But I want to read it because this notion of biracial accommodation is such a new, new concept, and it's such a nuanced concept, I want to get it as, as right as I can. The new system, a halfway house of racialized politics. A half century after the civil rights movement, blacks and whites in Alabama and the South seemingly have come to terms, terms that will amaze outsiders about living together in a halfway house of racialized politics. A new racial system has taken hold as the region develops a biracial functioning politics despite its hard racial history. For most Southerners, the Old South is dead. Southern democracy is a memory. Southern capital, Southern capital democracy, in quotes, when the Democrats reigned. The Republican Revolution has been consolidated, and two-party competition is a reality in various parts of the region. Most importantly, descendants of slaves and slave owners have reconciled pressures for systemic progress with certain aspects of their cultural past. And the civil rights movement of the 1950s six and 60s has morphed rather curiously, into a new order for the 21st century. This is neither the start past, you know, not what George Wallace promised, segregation forever, nor is it the future that Martin Luther King envisioned with little black and white children holding hands and playing together. It is a halfway house of racialized politics in which both white politicians and black politicians attempt to secure for themselves and their constituents the blessings of democracy and the goodies of political life. Furthermore, as this book illustrates, both sides now and express and appreciate, exhibit an appreciation of a new racial culture 
and a working relationship of biracial accommodation in pursuit of these blessings and goodies. What do I mean by those two things? First, new racial culture. Apparently, participants in today's South have come to accept the notion, the idea, that A, race and racism are real, critical, unavoidable legacies in the public arena. And that B, moderated race gaming is an appropriate way to do political business in contemporary regional democracy. The logic of this approach of this, is this cultural realization, this neocultural or neoracial cu uh, cultural outlook. The logic of this approach is straightforward. In a society which has shed sinister racist ways, yet where race constantly, consciously, and subconsciously colors public life. In fact, successful Southern politicians on both sides play the race game, even if they don't like the game or each other. What about biracial accommodation? As has already been stated, the new order essentially is a case of white and black cooperation in peculiarly regional fashion. Peaceful coexistence, Southern style. Modern Southern politics is indeed biracial in the sense that constitutional white supremacy and statutory segregation have yielded to openness and opportunity for blacks to participate. But the South's implementation of biracialism could just as well be labeled by hyphenated racialism with a hyphenated emphasis on racial divisions of power, race sensitive deliberations of policy, and sometimes dualistic programs for whites and blacks. Furthermore, this biracialism, as I've defined it, often smells of biracism. As politicians pursue electoral arrangements and governing outcomes for their own racial interests and to placate their racial constituencies. Both white and black politicians still seem super sensitive to the competing cultures in this troubled part of the country. Interestingly and importantly, white Southern politicians have been joined by others. Many blacks, liberal interests, and governmental agencies in adopting this approach because it serves select purposes of progress and practicality. Race-based policies and practices have now become routine options in regional politics. There's a lot to be uh, criticized about this halfway house of racialized politics, but it has proven functional and stable in this region. Biracial accommodation has survived very much, if not well, the lingering stench of racism, civil rights litigation, judicial scrutiny, physical concerns, and begrudge acceptance among blacks and whites. It is not pretty civics. It's just the continuing legacy and evolving politics of hard history. Race is the acknowledged powerful continuity in a new game whereby both whites and blacks now biracially accommodate important adjustments and routine politics in regional life. The practice of racial politics varies from state to state and even from region to region within states and much remains to be improved. 
But I believe that my analytical construct accurately depicts and explains real change throughout the old Confederacy. So that is what I mean by biracial accommodation. Conclu my conclusions, the Southern race game endures in modified form. We still play the race game in the South, but it has been modified. It's no longer just whites participating and pursuing the blessings while shutting out blacks. Second, real Southern politics has moderated substantially. These interactions between black and white politicians today are much different than they were back in the old days. Much different than they were back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And third, there is a new culture and practice of biracial accommodation in the changing South. It's not much to brag about, but it's better than anything we've ever tried before. So what I recommend for the future? One, I think academics and journalists need to explore the South's new racial politics with more theoretical boldness, not just going back and do the same old conventional stuff over and over. More theoretical boldness, more methodological creativity, and less normative myopia than in the past. Second, politicians need to deal carefully but honestly with the continuing reality of race in Southern politics and the broad, in the broader game of American democracy. The race game is not simply a Southern phenomenon. Never has been. As a matter of fact, the South today probably, since it's done away with the perversity and the contortion of white supremacy and segregation, the Southern race game is probably just a maybe more intense reflection of the national race game. And finally, my third recommendation, Barack Obama is welcome to start his uh, national dialogue on race here in the cradle of the uh, Confederacy and civil rights. Uh, those of you who don't have the book, I closed the book by suggesting that the president come here to talk about the race game because the South, <clears throat> that may surprise some people, but the black and white Southerners have been forced to come to terms and to deal with each other, which is more than has happened throughout the rest of the country. We may not have figured it out, but I think that uh, together we might learn something about how to deal with the, how to deal with our problem, and we might even help the rest of the country deal with theirs. That concludes my remarks, and I would now like to, uh, th there's a lot more in the book. But I don't want to bore you today with it. You, you, you can take a look at it. Uh, I see some folks out here whose, whose names I've mentioned in the book. And as I said, uh, this is a, a relatively brief analysis and commentary. If any of you wonder, I'll, I'll be happy to uh, share with you what's, in, what's coming up in the next book about you. Uh, no, it, it's, it's, I said good and bad and the ugly. As, as you know, I don't write bad stuff about, about people. Uh, if I do write bad stuff, I'm stuck in a couple of uh, pseudonyms. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd, I'd be happy to r respond to any questions that you may have. Please allow us to uh, give you the microphone to speak into. Uh, there are people in the other auditorium that would like to hear the question. I think we have uh, someone right here on the front row. By the way, I'm going to try to keep my answers to one minute each so that we can get, get more questions in. That'll be hard. I'm, as I told you, I'm a former professor and politician. Uh, it's going to be awfully hard. Yes, go ahead. Um, I'd rather call you professor. 
Um, Hello, hello. Yeah, yeah. Um, having the, the opportunity to live in the Midwest, in the South, and in the Northeast, New York in particular, I can make some comparisons. And I'll have to say, particularly Alabama and Montgomery, the accessibility to politicians is greater here than I've been anywhere else in the country. And I think that's a big plus. Uh, I don't know if, 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 because we're not so bureaucratic, you know, you know, I firmly believe if I wanna meet with the governor, I can make an appointment and it will happen. I don't think I can do that in Michigan. I don't think I can do that in New York. I don't even think I can do that in Atlanta. So that's a big plus that I think that we have worked in terms of just interaction. Number two, which I think is very, very important that we do not stress, and I've been coming to Alabama since I, my mama put me in a footlocker, you know, to come for the summer, that back in the 40s and the 50s, you know, when the, the vote was not, you know, uh, black folks didn't have the franchise, but you had your little HNICs. Mm -hmm, I won't say what that is. And you picked your colored folks. And, you know, and some Negroes uh, couldn't sit well. Well, some whites couldn't sit well with certain Negroes. And so it was the little Negro leader. And I think that lasted all the way up almost to 2000. You know, y'all call him the dean of politics and whatever, whatever. And I have some archives. And one is a dear, dear friend of mine. It's Rufus Lewis. I loved him. But he was the one that the white community went to to talk to one single black person playing the game now to make certain you bring whatever that block vote, black block vote, whether there were 10 votes or then up to the, 2000 you had more but you didn't deal with the black community and now I do think there is a change in that relationship and that you find I believe starting with Bobby Bright here in Montgomery and now with Mayor Todd Strange because um, Mayor Fulmer just was not going to come period <laughs> that you're beginning to see that the black community is not monolithic and that we're not ignorant people and that we do have a lot of smart grassroots people who are worth hearing. And I think that needs to be chronicled. And it's not like a real fight means like you have in Chicago where when, they, when the politician comes to the black community, it's head, you know, button heads. And I think that needs to be chronicled and to kind of, as you use the term, the accommodation, as some kind of construct, some kind of model that might can be replicated, particularly in the Midwest and in the Northeast. For, for those who are in the other room, I, I think the question is, uh, she was pointing out the, the fact that things are changing. In the old days, a few black leaders represented the black community, and white leaders dealt with those black leaders. That is uh, absolutely true, and that's one of the differences in, in the new uh, racial politics. And I will tell you, what you're describing has been chronicled. It's in my second book. Uh, on the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, in, uh, which I use myself, uh, three chapters on myself as a case study, uh, I use, uh, we, we talked to about a dozen members of Congress, white congressmen from throughout the South, uh, and we talked to uh, about 10 or so Alabama leaders from uh, that period to talk to, uh, who talked to us about what was happening. And I can testify, I can testify to that. When I started my career, I did not know the black people of Alabama. I dealt through leaders. I did that, and uh, uh, by the way, uh, one of the reasons why uh, the book does chronicle that, and I think it, it is so unique is it not only is the second book, does the second book talk about Southern politics from inside Southern politics, but my co-author is an African-American 
from young lady from Mobile, has a PhD from Howard University, who worked for me in Congress, who has made me very sensitive to statements saying that I have talked to the black people when I have talked to a few black leaders. So that uh, has been uh, chronicled and will be in the next book. By the way, the next book is about quiet, practical, biracial change in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, or what we, the title of the book we say, we entitle it Stealth Reconstruction, where white politicians quietly work with some black leaders to change things. Yes? Uh, Representative Browder or Congressman Browder or Professor Browder, whichever you prefer, uh, one thing you said was that uh, people in academics and reporters ought to be bold. Well, I'm going to see how bold you are. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the presidential election, President Obama was elected by a nice majority uh, nationwide. Alabama, I think, was his second lowest state. He got about 39% in Alabama. He got a little bit less in Oklahoma. But of all the 50 states... By far, the smallest percentage of white vote that Obama got was Alabama. No other state really close. Uh, a recent example, we re recently had a state Senate special election in a basically Democratic district where a black sitting House member was running against a really conservative white Republican. She won the uh, Democrat black candidate, won the s Democratic nomination very handily in a district that's about 30 or so percent black, and just got wiped out in the general election because she got such a small percentage of the white vote. Taking that recent history, and your thesis, I, I'm anxious to read your book, and I'm sure your last chapter probably answers my question, but how do you translate that history plus your theories in the book to what's going to happen in the governor's race next year? <laughs> now let's see you be bold. Okay, well, well I, I'll just go, uh, the, the question is, how do I relate my book and my thesis to the uh, 2010 governor's race? Well, f well first, I'll uh, deal with uh, the, most of what you said. Uh, the race game endures. It's still here. I will say that today, and if you really study the presidential election in uh, Alabama, you will find that there are certain things that uh, figure into that, but you will, uh, will find that race used to be the driving force in Alabama and the South. Today, it is a driving force, but not the driving force. Which, and there's a difference. Now, you've asked about the 2010 governor's race. Yes, I'll answer that. Uh, I think your, your, your question is, can Archer Davis win the governorship? Well, I've got uh, several friends in that race, so I'm not going to handicap the field. <laughs> but I will tell you this. I don't know. <laughs> and anybody who tells you yes or no, I think it's just blowing smoke. That race is TBD, to be determined. Uh, I, can, I can foresee a scenario whereby Arthur Davis can be elected governor. I can see several scenarios where Arthur Davis, Arthur Davis cannot be elected governor. If I had to spell out, uh, again, I'm not... I've got several friends, uh, including Archer Davis, in that race. I have uh, gone on record before, and I'll do it here. I think the scenario for Archer Davis to be elected governor is Archer Davis has to have a clear and clean run in the Democratic primary. The Republicans have to nominate somebody from one of their ideological or economic bases. Then the Democrats have to run a very powerful campaign on civics and economics uh, uh, in, uh, in the general election, along with a very powerful get-out-the-vote drive. And Republicans have to respond with a bumbling campaign 
And finally, mm -hmm. Arthur Davis has to study and live the new racial politics as I've, as I've outlined it in this book. I'll, uh, I'll go on with another prediction. I don't think anybody's going to get elected governor in 2010 who doesn't read or at least understand my book. <laughs> uh, that's, that sounds like shameless self-promotion. <laughs> it, it is shameless self-promotion. But, but the point is, if anybody who doesn't understand the new culture, whereby we black and white acknowledge the role of race and racism in our, our history and our present, and if they don't understand the uh, positive biracial accommodation, I can tell you this, and I'm going, I've gone over my minute, but the, my advice to uh, current politicians is understand the changing times, understanding the role of race in our history and present, understand biracial accommodation, and understand that the race card will be played. There are few races. Well, I think in a majority of the races in Alabama, the race card is played. If you don't play it, your opponent will. Your supporters will. Your opponent's supporters will. The question is whether you play the race card positively and constructively. And it can be played positively and constructively. Obama did it. But if you either pander to your racial constituency, or if you compromise with the other racial constituency, overly compromise to the other constituency, you're going to get burned. That's a very tough, uh, risky road to walk, and I recommend anybody who wants to walk that road needs to read the book. And I, I'll tell you this. For us to have the next good governor, especially, not only has to read the book to get elected, but needs to read the book in order to govern Alabama in the future. Hi, I'm Eileen Jones from Channel 12. I, uh, we just went through a very contentious school board um, selection process of a new superintendent here in which race was a huge issue. So I really want to know more specifically what is your solution to that kind of animosity? And I, if you mentioned about being myopic, people are myopic because they know of no other way to see the world. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm unclear what the solution is. I really don't have a solution. Oh. <laughs> However, I think that more and more such instances are, uh, th those instances are occurring less and less, and it's decreasingly fashionable for politicians to play that game. Uh, the new Southern, the new racial politics is different from one, one uh, state to another, or even within a state. You know, you, you talk about uh, Montgomery, you look up at Coleman, uh, you look in Birmingham, mayor's race last year. Uh, in most places, especially with younger Southerners, Younger Southerners are more able to deal with these issues. Uh, in some places, however, in some times, if you've got, if you've got the legacy, if you've got history against you in your area, if you've got the, the current legacy against you, for example, history just brought in today in terms of the economic situation, in terms of the educational situation, in terms of the, the demographics, and where you've got opportunistic politicians, you're in a tight because it's going to be very easy in those circumstances to revert back to the old politics. And we, we see it happen. We see it happening now not only in uh, places where they're white majorities, but where they're black majorities, you know, the reverse race game. But as I said, uh, just about everybody plays the race game at some time in some manner 
uh, during their careers. The question is whether you pay, play it positively uh, or negatively. I don't know uh, what the solution is in Montgomery. Uh, this, this is just one of those situations where history and the legacies of history have combined to remind us of what the race game has been historically in the South. Uh, again, I wish I had, had a solution to it. But that is, a, I think, decreasingly the pattern throughout the South. Hey, Dr. Browder, uh, what do you feel the future holds in terms of this uh, racial politics? I mean, the timing of the book right now with Obama being elected president, I mean, what do you feel? What do you feel that's going to be happening in the future in the state of Alabama in terms of racial politics? Well, uh, the, the question is what I think is going to ha be happening in the future in Alabama in terms of racial politics. I have uh, confidence that it's going to improve. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the old days are over. We still got the history to remind us, and we've got, the, we've got the legacies of the old days. Just drive around Montgomery, and you see the legacies. Uh, but I think more and more those things will uh, decrease. Nobody believes that Obama's election kills the, uh, the role of race. What it may do is make it more, give us an opportunity to talk about it realistic, realistically. Uh, but I think things will improve in Alabama, especially, I'm especially uh, impressed with that idea because of what I see, but also what others say. If you read the book, uh, any of you know Dr. Jess Brown at uh, uh, Athens State University, one of my former students. Uh, uh, he, he says he's noticed, uh, especially up in the northern part of the state, where young professional political leaders on school boards and so forth, get together, black and white, and they talk about real community problems and they're focused on real community problems. Some of those problems relate to race and the legacy of, of race. But they deal with those problems without resorting to racial rancor. The younger people, I think, are more able to do that. Uh, Dr. Paul Hubbard of the Alabama Education Association made the same point. He thinks that uh, we are, especially with younger Alabamians, we, we have evidence of moving forward. And, you know, he's been around for a long, he's like me, he's been around for, uh, for the race game uh, for a long time. He thinks the same thing. Uh, I have a two-part question. Uh, what do you think, or do you think the civil rights movement made uh, a contributing factor to the biracial accommodation? Oh, absolutely. I, I don't mean to diminish the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. Uh, the point that I make in my book, and this, this irritates, I, I said I'm, I say enough things to irritate all my old friends. Uh, my problem is with people who focus on the civil rights movement as a heroic drama and they don't pay attention to what has happened since then. A lot of things have happened since then that are in a, a more positive direction. To take nothing away from the, uh, from the uh, civil rights movement. I was out at Alabama State a couple of months ago talking, and one of the professors was talking about their young students, uh, African Americans don't seem to have an appreciation for the uh, civil rights movement. And I had to remind my colleagues, look, these are kids. The average freshman at Alabama State University, African-American freshman, was born after 1990. The average freshman parents were born after the Civil Rights Movement. They have to go back to their grandparents to find somebody to talk to about the Civil Rights Movement. And my suggestion was, I'd suggest that you 
rather than pounding the civil rights movement into your, your kids. Of, of course, we have to. You know, we can't lose our history. Because, as uh, Faulkner said, the past is uh, never past. Uh, and what I found is that the uh, racial beast of the past lives on because we won't let it die. But what, rather than pounding that history into their heads, pound into their heads contemporary issues. Deal with the legacies of, the, uh, of uh, Alabama history. You know, the economic disparities, the uh, criminal uh, prosecute uh, the criminal uh, conspiracies uh, or disparities. Talk to your young people about those things as much as you talk to them about history. So, uh, yes, I think the civil rights movement was terrific in moving us forward, but we also need to understand that uh, a heck of a lot has passed. We've had a half century since uh, George Wallace said segregation forever and Martin Luther King uh, had his vision. Glenn, do you think that the creation of uh, single-member legislative and congressional districts uh, that uh, create safe districts for black uh, candidates and safe districts for white candidates, uh, racially pure districts, do you think that that has helped or do you think that that has helped to perpetuate racism? Now you're stirring a, <laughs> up a one of my issues as a, as a politician. It has helped because it was part of the civil rights, result of the civil rights movement. However, I think you reach a point to where you have to revisit those issues. Uh, I won't say who, but uh, in the, uh, one of the books, one of your leading politicians mentioned to me that you need to sit down with uh, Joe Reed one day and have a conversation with him about that because he thinks that maybe today we would be better served if we had African Americans in Alabama with their influence spread out amongst numerous politicians rather than in, wrapped up in just one. So I think it, uh, it has helped because it, it was inevitable, it was needed as a result of the Civil Rights Movement. However, as you move along, I think that you probably need to revisit uh, some, of, some of these issues. Uh, I can tell you, <coughs> in my constituencies, when I had 25% black constituencies, that meant a lot to me. When redistricting came along, and they looked at turning my district into a 90% white district. I told the people doing the redistricting that, you know, that's going to change things tremendously. What you're going to end up with is you're going to lose a congressman who tries to represent both whites and blacks and create a congressman who represents whites. So, uh, yes, I, I think it helped, but, but there, there's another side to the picture. By the way, one of the solutions that people have come up with is rather than packing super majority district, you know, you don't need 65% black to elect a black congressman. Or all you need is today is 55%. And that may be a way of addressing the issues that you've raised. Dr. Browder, we have time for one more question. I think there's a gentleman in the back. Okay. Um, you've talked about the transition time and having been Yankee by birth, but lived more th in the South. And the Civil War was still being discussed and opinions toward the Yankee are still being expressed over the Civil War. Do you think the racial trend will take as long as the Civil War to get over? <laughs> Is the Civil War over? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the question I is, Will it take us as long to get over our racial problems as it is to uh, uh, get over the uh, South's resentment at uh, losing the Civil War? Uh, probably. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I, I think we're stuck with these things. Uh, the race, I think we're stuck with the race game for a long, you, you can't have our history and our legacy and be colorblind. You know, it makes a good you know, civic speech, but you can't have that and, and govern in a place like Alabama. So that will continue and probably, <coughs> yes, this, the Civil War will, will be a long time before it's, it's forgotten. I was just joking about whether it's over. Oh, we know it's over and we won. <laughs> Does that, that conclude the program? Yes, sir. Dr. Browder will be here for a few minutes. If you would like for him to sign your copy of his book, or if you have more questions, he will be here to talk with you. I, I'll be you. happy to talk with you after the session. Thank you.